Perfect. And there you are. I just got through texting you. How are you, Jim? Nice to see you. Can you hear me okay? Hey, Rinslow. Hey, Jim. How are you? I'm good, nice to see you. Nice to see you as well, it's been a while. It's been too long, actually I, I Let's see, I just texted you, but never mind. I was just making sure I was I was sitting here alone for a minute or two. And, you know, there's so many so many ways to get Zoom all screwed up. I managed to screw them all up. <laughs> totally. Yeah, you're a little early, which thank, thank you for that. Um, we're sure. starting at noon. Yeah. And the majority of people will be um, coming in right at noon, um, maybe a few minutes late. Oh, sure. We'll, we'll likely hold it till just a few minutes after and then we'll sure. get started oh that's fine how's your life you know it's good i mean certainly the the news of the weekend took a right. lot of felt very um liberating in many yeah. ways and exciting and uh we know it's you know it's going to be hard in many many ways but having um sane and competent leadership that respect science and oh my god imagine that health and you know yeah and not having to you know waking up in the morning just you know petrified about what has been done or said yeah um, that that's right won't, that won't happen <laughs> you know and i'm sure you know there'll be you know disagreements about policy and, and program and what have you but it'll be disagreements with with people who are um not bad actors you know yes yes i do oh i so, agree not to mention wonderful news from the vaccine you know very early and still that you got to take some encouragement from that it yeah i think it was just sort of like the trifecta so i mean obviously the election right and then um you know, Cabot Tegrevier, um, long acting um, for cis women. Yep. Huzzah, huzzah. And then Pfizer, you know, and the vaccine. And on a platform that looks like this, this gives a very good indication for these other similar vaccines, right? So it was just like, oh my God, I, I, I can't take it. This is <laughs> all this great news. Like, right. I was like jumping up and down for real. Exactly. What do we do with good news? Um, <laughs> it's been so long. Uh, yeah. That, and the spontaneous celebrations were just a pleasure to participate in and to watch. And oh, yeah. We all needed it. And you're right. It's, it's actually even a more harrowing time because this topic, COVID, is so bad and so much worse. And we're really no. looking at a grim a grim winter. I know I'm, I'm so <laughs> concerned about that. And that is, yeah, I mean, so, you know, you're taking all those other things and then what we're, what we're facing, you know, uh, with this pandemic. And again, the only relief I really get is, is that we're going to have people soon in charge who are going to take it seriously. And that's not going to get us, you know, that's not going to fix how grim the winter is, but yeah. it's going to be, at least we have people in charge who, uh, you know, like the task force they put together is pretty stellar. Yeah. Right. You know, yeah. it's a good, it's a good group of people. Um, yeah. I mean, if you, you know, if you look to Germany or other countries where there's good science, uh, good economy, stable, responsible leadership, they're also in trouble. I mean, right. it, you know, yeah. it, it's a, it's a wonderful lesson that, um, yeah, we, we just have a, 
a terrible, formidable adversary in coronavirus. And so the, the vaccine is sort of the adjunct we've all been needing. That's going to help, but it's not going to help till well into next year. And so life like this for another year. So the, the next, to my mind, the next critical thing is the Senate and will there actually be responsible leadership that's meaningful that, that extends the benefits. And, but I, I you know, it, yeah. that's at least possible. Um, all eyes on Georgia. Seriously. Yeah. 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 Because that clearly we're going to need to get relief to people and um, the misery people have felt so far is going to be just exponentially worse. Um, going into this uh into this winter now um and yeah. without any sort of without relief from the government and and you know and the state that all this 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 the situation that we are we're in with the state and city and states and cities all across the country like we need federal support yeah you know yeah no it's been criminal that they haven't done it since basically september um yeah i would say you know, Mitch McConnell, he's, uh, he, he's the next target. <clears throat> oh, my God. I wanted him out of there so bad. I mean, I knew it was a long shot, but. Yeah. I, I really, 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 really. And I, I really was hopeful we would flip the Senate. Um, but, you know, like you said, it's, it's not. Uh, it ain't over. Um, we have a shot with Georgia and I'm going to. You know, I just signed up today to write letters to Georgia. Good. Um, through my ward here, and um, you know, keep the keep the little bit of donations I can do going forward to these guys. And yeah, it's just you know, and the people they're running against are just such again criminals. You know, like <laughs> they're so bad. Yes. And yet. They have a constituency and we saw, you know, nationally there's, you know, 71 million or something think our leadership is great. Mm -hmm. It's so disconcerting. Yeah. That's, um, that's, that there's gotta be long-term work given to that. Um, at one point, somebody said that um, the Republican party was now the party of the working person in the United States. And that's a, <laughs> That's that, that's that's a statement to be examined and unpacked and um, you know <laughs> encountered and that'll 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 take some time. That is so you know Orwellian. Know. Freedom is slavery. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> you know um, up Yikes. is down. Two plus two equals five. Like that is just that that they can position themselves and and. Uh, and, and people actually then believe it. It's just astounding. Yeah. But you know, it's rooted in it's rooted in racism, and we have to uh, undo it. And that's the long, hard work. You know, like we have to confront it, acknowledge it, and we have to undo it in in small, medium, and big ways. Yeah. And the, that's work. That's that's the work of lifetimes. Nope. Um, commitment of generations to do that. And no, that's right. I, I hope we can, you know, I hope we've turned enough of a corner around awareness around this. And now we have some decent leadership that we can start doing that, you know, in earnest. I agree. Jim, I'm going to answer one um, text from a study participant and then I'll be right back on. Sure. No worries. We're still a little bit early. Great. And I see some AFCers joining. Thanks for being here. Um, you're a little early, which is lovely. Renslow's here. He'll be getting started uh, shortly after the hour as we let people uh, log in. But thanks for being here. Hey, Renslow, thank you so much for doing this. It's John, how are you? Hi, John. I'm good. I'm, I'm always happy to talk to my friends at AFC. Uh, well, th thank you. Especially under the circumstances. I don't know if Jim knew it when he planned it, but to plan it right around uh, 
you know, positive election results, good vaccine outcome. Um, you know, our, the timing is pretty good for even a little bit of optimism, even if it's not directed yet towards, uh, towards COVID. Maybe, maybe I can describe a light at the end of this tunnel. Yes, I think we'll, we'd all appreciate that. <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, it's mixed. I'm, I'm, I will, but I will also say, you know, buckle down for another year like this. But by the end of the next year, by around this time next year, I think we'll be looking at much different prospects. And that's, um, that's encouraging. And really, the, the vaccine story for, for proof of concept, that probably could not be better. 90% um, is spectacular. Of course, this is a press release, not the data. And so we'll have to wait and see. But it is delicious, isn't it? When the whole country gets to understand what a DSMB is, a, a scientific <laughs> review board, how they're independent of everybody, including the CEO of Pfizer and any interested um, you know, presidents and vice presidents. It turns out they're just working on their own, that science takes its own time. And that's been a, a delicious reality. Uh, so delicious. Week. Yeah, um, so delicious. delicious you know, I was a great way to put I, it. I was a little. I was a little. Um, I think you know you should always be skeptical, right? But I was skeptical about those results, and then I happened to be on a press conference call with a bunch of people talking about um, 084, the cab study, and Fauci was there to give a few comments. And because the press was there and Pfizer had just announced, they asked Fauci to if he would agree to make a comment about. The Pfizer vaccine, and he was really enthusiastic. So, his sort of, you know, I mean, again, you know, he hadn't seen all the data, but he, his enthusiastic response definitely made me more excited. Yeah. Well, yeah, it seems momentous on several different levels. Um, and congratulations for the upcoming rescheduled gala and virtual everything. It's just, amazing that we really are, we, you, everybody is resilient enough to sort of manage this and, um, and continue on. So it's really important. So. Well, thank you. Yeah. I think we all just have to, you know, do what we have to do. Um, and we're doing our best to figure it out. So, yeah. Right. Right on. So, um, I'm going to give it another minute or so Renslow and then I'm gonna sure. I'm gonna do a little wind up for you and then I'm gonna uh, stop sharing and you can go ahead and share your screen and we can get started okay but thanks to folks who have already been here while we're assembling in the last minute or so just a reminder um, feel free to leave um, questions and comments in the chat, I will watch that and I will make sure Renslow has a chance to address them. Renslow, while you're talking, if there's moments where you wanna take a breath and slow down and say, I'll just pause for some questions, feel free to do that. I can feed you them at that time. Um, of course, if people want to ask a question um, verbally and on camera, that's great too. So uh, uh, please feel free to do that. You can raise your hand and so I'll know that you're interested in doing that or you can leave a note in the chat. And I think that's it for, um, oh, and logistic, in terms of logistics as ever, we'll share the recording uh, and the actual slide set. Um, I'll send it around to this group and then we have a, um, a place in the, in the internet world where all of this stuff lives with all the other um, grand rounds we've done. Yeah, and if there were follow-up questions, I'd be happy to answer emails or talk um, afterwards if anybody wanted to contact me. It, Jim pointed out these are fairly data-laden um, slides. I always, I never want to, you know, thin out a presentation. It's pretty much, you know, the content that I would use at a in a scientific meeting. But it's it will be at you know it just available for you for your own interpretation and use later on if you if you have that interest. Thank you, Renslow. You're the best. And with that, like, let's, let's just, uh, let's uh, get you rolling here. I, I wanna thank you uh, for being here. Um, Renslow, for, for folks who may not know, um, is one of the founders of AFC. 
So way back when, I think everything was still in black and white back then when you founded AFC. That's right. Um, so 35 years, amazing. And we're, we're coming up on our gala. So, so Runslow has been in this to win it for a really long time. He is a clinician and a world-renowned researcher, um, really incredibly smart and lovely human being. Um, and he's going to be talking to us today um, about a sample of, of cases from University of Chicago, people who have had COVID, 401 individuals, but also going to be bringing in some of the latest news, talking about kind of where we're at in terms of the epidemiology, what's happening in the Chicago area in terms of the, what's happening in the pandemic, the new task force that's been um, introduced by um, the president-elect, the Pfizer vaccine. He has a lot to cover in the next few minutes. So I'm gonna stop yakking. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and invite Renslow to take it from there. Thanks, Renslow. Well, thank you, uh, Jim and John and AFC. It is really always a pleasure to, to talk to you all. Can you see my slides okay? Yeah, okay, good. I see you nodding your head, great. So yeah, as, as um, you know, I, I wanted to talk about the first folks that we saw, this is a cohort from March and April last year, partly out of respect for this, you know, AIDS Foundation was there at the very beginning, back when I was seeing a trickle of HIV patients at Cook County Hospital, and it just felt like symmetrical um, to share what we saw at the very beginning of the COVID epidemic. And now here we are, of course, and in a second wave. And I'll talk about that a little bit too. So I'll describe that as a way to introduce sort of what it, what it felt like initially and up to date a little bit on epidemiology, prevention and treatment and the wonderful vaccine news. And then put this in the context that I know you all know very well, which is uh, the context of uh, the human rights and he uh, health framework. Um, I'm really indebted to a wonderful group of co-workers at UC. It's a large group um, and they are um, largely responsible for the actual ongoing hands-on work uh, that is done. So what we did in this presentation, we just presented this at a meeting in Glasgow in Scotland was to look back at charts and do an electronic data review and, and apply a definition of what's severe disease, the same actually criteria that they use in the uh, remdesivir clinical trials and to make an, a very broad inclusive uh, definition of immune compromise to include HIV, but also folks with cancer, folks who had had transplantation or who are on immunocompromising medications. And that followed this rubric, and this is from the remdesivir trials that said, if you need something more than low flow oxygen, then you have severe respiratory problems and we consider you to have severe COVID illness. And I, I actually think that definition is a little incomplete, but this is what we saw. And I'll just share some, some, some data with you. Um, the mean age of the folks we saw was 60. That's been true everywhere. And a much higher mortality was predicted by older age. That's as you all well know. Half were women. 90% of our cohort was African-Americans. Um, and three out of four uh, had a uh, an address that was uh, on the south side. The average duration from when they first got sick to when they first came to the hospital was six days, but you can see it went as long as in a couple of cases longer than a month. And like most other reports, the most common things were fever, shortness of breath and cough, and that was in two thirds of patients. But we actually saw a fair amount of GI presentation. So diarrhea, nausea, vomiting in almost a third and in our hands that predicted a less severe course. So that's um, somewhat reassuring. But I point out a couple of unusual presentations in 20% of folks, they had altered mental status or confusion, particularly in the elderly. 5% of people were just found unresponsive. Um, and um, actually only about 11% uh, had upper respiratory symptoms. Up in the upper right, these are the oxygen requirements. And it's just to say that even it, during hospitalization, two out of three patients only needed either room air or low flow oxygen. So most people who go in the hospital 
they don't have these huge oxygen needs. On the other hand, in the red at the end, you could see that up to, um, in this case, 17% of people ended up with severe oxygen needs and needing to be intubated. These were the therapies that we were using, and a lot of them included this HCQ, which is hydroxychloroquine, in about a third of patients. But one of the things that distinguished our group was a third of them were uh, received remdesivir because they were enrolled in the clinical trials. And that's a higher figure than most of the other early cohorts. So we were lucky to have aggressive enrollment of patients into those trials. About 9% got uh, corticosteroids and one in five got the immune modulator tocilizumab. And then finally down at the bottom, and these are actually quite um, low numbers, 51 people total died uh, 30 days after discharge, and that's an, a mortality rate of 13%. And I'll show you some data that that compares actually pretty well uh, to other, other sites. So that's what it looked like in terms of symptoms before presentation. You can see most of these folks are around at six to seven days or shorter. But there was a third, uh, uh, almost a quarter of people who presented um, more than seven days later and 5% more than two weeks after the onset of symptoms. So sometimes it takes a while. And uh, this, is the, this is a busy um, graph, a table, but it shows the incidence of the comorbid conditions that people had before they come. And I'm sure you've seen in the literature, like everywhere else, we saw that having high blood pressure or diabetes, being obese, having chronic kidney disease or heart failure, all of those things predicted a greater likelihood of falling over here in this category under severe illness. But in contrast to that in red, you see we had 56 people with current or past cancer, or we had a variety of other immunocompromising conditions, including eight people with HIV, nine people with solid organ transplants. And across this whole group, both individually and then aggregated to 55 people with immunocompromising conditions, that, did not, um, that was not associated with more severe illness in our hands. A little bit surprising. You might think that COVID would tend to be worse in that patient population, but we didn't find that. So there's the cancer and there's the immune compromised group. Now, there are a lot of limits to this particular analysis. It's retrospective and the numbers are pretty small and it's only in one site. And we deliberately cast a very wide net and said we want a broad definition of, of immunocompromised to look for a signal of greater COVID illness. Um, and we still don't understand all of the different immuno requirements, immunologic requirements for susceptibility to HIV. <clears throat> and that the next iteration of studies that looks at much larger numbers of people with HIV or people with transplant are, are going to give more precise answers to these questions. But there's some reassurance in these data. And we also think the two things that I would comment on further is just this issue of mortality and severe illness, and then the definition of severe illness itself. So if you look at what we saw in reports all over the place in that first critical two month uh, period from China, from Spain, from New York City, I'll just show you some mortality data. And it really matters what the mean age was because age is such a strong predictor of mortality. Um, in China, it was 13.7% with a mean age of 64. In Spain, with a mean age of 70, it was 28%. In New York City, 24.5% and their mean age like ours was uh, 62. Henry Ford Hospital had a much higher, that was about two thirds African-Americans in their cohort with a mean age of 57 and their initial mortality was 20.2%. In the recovery data, that's the, where we learned that dexamethasone can improve mortality in the United Kingdom. Their mean age was 66 years and their mortality was between 21 and 24%. So in comparison to those, our overall mortality data look actually pretty good. And we thought this was very important because as you all know, in our city and actually in the country, there's a two to three fold increased mortality rate in African-Americans with COVID compared to whites. And it's even higher in the United States if you look at younger age groups, that's where that disparity even gets worse. 
in our hands with this relatively lower mortality in a cohort that's 90% African American, it suggests that that's not a, there's not a biological reason for the observation of differences in mortality and that it may much be more likely related to access to care, other um, untreated comorbidities, um, social and healthcare access issues as compared to a biologic difference. And then the last thing I'll share with you from this, we saw like many others have reported very serious incidents of um, clinical syndromes that happened during the hospital, like liver injury, kidney injury, altered mental status, bacterial co-infections, uncontrolled diabetes, cardiac toxicity, and that's just going down this list. And you can see here with a very high p-value, these are all much more significantly associated with severe illness, including, um, including mortality. That's also true for blood clots and deep vein thrombosis and pulmonary embolism. And so one of the things that we think maybe we should re-examine is we shouldn't only be defining the illness with oxygen criteria and talking about pneumonia alone. We probably should include some of these other organ systems, particularly the kidneys and the heart uh, and uh, uh, diabetes and, and, and carbohydrate, carbohydrate metabolism. So that's the first portion of the, of the talk. And the conclusion again was, we just didn't see as an association with severe illness in this broadly defined immunocompromised group, including those with HIV. And I should say in our group, all the people with HIV were on therapy, were fully suppressed and they had T cells over 200. So it's not actually a group where you might think they would have greater immunocompromise. And then we did see lots of incident syndromes associated with severe illness. They're listed again here, but we may actually need to broaden as we think about effective therapy, um, the, Ill the definition of COVID illness. And it, you know, it's, it's interesting that we're still evolving the best way to define and use metrics for outcomes related to um, COVID. And I'll, I'll come back to that. I did think since this is AIDS Foundation that I should speak to HIV and, and uh, COVID. Um, and uh, the, the points that I think I'd make here is most importantly, as we didn't see it, many large cohorts have looked at this and have not found a greater incidence of a greater likelihood of severe illness or death in people with HIV overall. There is one recent paper that's well done that looks specifically at people less than 200 that did find increased mortality in that group. And I'll show that to you. And then of course, you all are as familiar as I am with all the different disruptions on, in our lives with COVID related to healthcare and appointments and lab tests and, or decrease in uh, the availability of insurance. Certainly the rise of virtual encounters, I think are, is a good thing, good thing for providers and for patients, though it's complicated, um, but certainly as an effective alternative to stay in touch, I think it's been important. And much more importantly for our patient population and for our, our city and the world is the devastating impacts of overcrowding and housing as an example and lack of ability to social distance. Certainly job security, food security has become a huge issue. And all of that is around H, uh, uh, health and human rights. And, and I think that's a topic again that the staff of AIDS Foundation of Chicago are very familiar with and all of your patient population. In fact, I'd say in the field of COVID, those who are sort of pointing in this direction are those, oftentimes those who've done a lot of HIV work uh, in the past. Anyway, I'll just show this to you briefly. This was the VA cohort study. And this kind of tells the story in the red box down below that they looked at compared to veterans with HIV and veterans without HIV, very large numbers, 253 compared to um, four, 504, no difference in hospitalization, in intensive care transfer, in intubation, or in death. So a very, that's the biggest study in the United States so far that says there was no signal. And in that study, about 80% of all the people with HIV had their virus load control and they were on ART. And then more recently, this was this um, study just presented at ID Week looking at 286 people from 36 institutions. And they did find that lower CD4 count predicted decreased survival. So this is the first time I've seen 
pretty clear indication that people with HIV with low CD4 cells, more likely poor adherence um, and more likely to be off antiretroviral therapy, um, possibly with other comorbidities, hypertension and chronic lung disease, in this case, were also associated with it, were associated with decreased survival rates. And then I just, I think you all probably know this as well. There are very good guidelines for um, thinking about HIV and COVID, both from the DHHS guidelines and from the HIVMA. And they talk about some of these other issues like uh, how to order labs in the meantime and the use of e-visits and some good sections on pregnancy and children and uh, patients with HIV who are opioid addicted. Little uh, bit of um, information about mental health management and morale. And so with the very same conclusion that I've already told you that the early data suggested that there wasn't a greater likelihood of more severe COVID illness in all patients with HIV. So that's the first half. I can pause if there are questions that you've already gotten, Jim, and then I'll move on. This is going to be treatment, the current treatment vaccines and a little bit about human rights in the next 10 minutes or so, and then I'll open it up to questions. Thanks, Renslow. I don't have questions in the chat, but if people want, I'll pause and if someone wants to throw out a question or a, uh, something, a clarification, um, please do so. Yeah. And, and, and while we're kind of pausing, I, I just wrote down, um, wanted to get your thoughts. A, a, couple, a couple of grand rounds ago, we had a, a former staffer um, who used to work with AFC, um, has had COVID since March. Um, she was never hospitalized. She's in the UK. She was never hospitalized, but it's been quite a serious um, journey for her. And it's this, you know, she's a, the part of this growing group of people we're understanding as long haulers. So I just wonder if you had, you know, we heard a lot from her about her personal kind of being this long haul COVID patient and, um, ups and downs associated with that, a lot of downs. So I'm just wondering what you had to, what your thoughts were on this. Um, yeah, I have, a, I have a slide on it. Um, there, it's very real that some people seem to have prolonged symptoms. Uh, brain fog has been reported, especially in younger people. So neurologic issues, problem with concentration. People who've had heart disease or heart complications have a much greater likelihood of chronic heart problems. In one study, about one in five people with bad pneumonia had continuing fibrosis or issues. So there's very clearly, we're going to learn about the impact of chronic COVID. We don't know about um, management. Does it, you know, is, is there a particular therapy? So I, we don't have any insights into that, but it's, it's certainly very real what that person is feeling. And there is a clinic starting at University of Chicago, several other I know cohorts are, are um, saying, stay with us and we'll try to understand what's going on and manage this. The, the newest therapy, the monoclonal antibodies are only being directed to people with high risk and um, earlier, uh, you know, earlier infection, so not advanced disease. So I really don't know at the moment about um, any particular therapy for that. I'd say stay tuned. And um, yeah, and I'll, I, will, uh, I will get to that. It's a very oh, important issue. Thank you. Uh, I'll pause another second. Does anyone wanna jump in, unmute and say something, ask something? Okay, seeing none, Renslow, it's all yours. Okay, I'll keep going. Um, you know, I, I think it's been stunning to watch the up and down um, story. Uh, I'll, I'll start with our current ep epidemiology and, and then spend just a couple of minutes thinking about these human rights implications and uh, finish with treatment. So here we are, this was yesterday. And um, this sharp rise, of course, the thing that worries me most about the appearance of this graph is that there's no peak or end in sight. And, it's, I'm not surprised to hear IDPH advise us to stay home. The next step will be a mandatory lockdown, which I think may be necessary. So I wanna urge you all to follow what IDPH says, stay indoors, stay at home if you can for these three weeks and regard this as the most dangerous moment in the epidemic so far, because it is. 
that's what our country looks like with the extraordinary density now in the uh, in the Midwest. Um, you know, Chicago and Cook County were spared from that map for quite a while, um, and I think we have reasons to be proud of our city and our state for having tried to follow the science. Um, but our region, in some ways, has taken us over. Northern Indiana, southern Wisconsin, all of Wisconsin, the Dakotas have really been hot spots, and that is definitely driving part of our experience. And you can see that looking in the United States overall, there's that same graph. Daily cases have risen in 28%, deaths have risen 21%, hospitalizations 18%. And we're in, you know, we're in crisis mode in several parts of the country. As you've seen, El Paso is inundated and overwhelmed. Uh, Green Bay, Wisconsin, there, there are many other centers that are like that. And I'll show you some of these numbers. And this is a little bit confusing. I'll try to walk this through this color code, but these are like four different occasions when I've talked about COVID. May to July to October and then to today. And so you'll see that same color coding. So when I first did it, it was 3 million cases worldwide, a quarter of a million deaths. And by July, that was 15 million and 641,000. Or at the local United States level, one to 4 million cases, 75,000 to almost 150,000 deaths. And here in Illinois, that went from 66 to 169. And What's so disturbing is how, when you now go up, up again to October and November, just the rapid jump. Now we're from three to 15 to 34 to 50 million cases worldwide and up to 1.2 million cases worldwide. Or again, in the United States, 1.2 to four to seven to all, now 10 million cases and uh, a quarter of a million, over a quarter of a million deaths. Or again, here at home, 66,000 to 169,000 to now almost half a million cases, 10,538 deaths. And the way that played out in our hospital was 1,600 cases and then 45 to now 6,200 cumulative cases at the University of Chicago. And so if you play that out on a daily rate, you can see that Cook County has suddenly gone up to Accumulatively, 214,000 with 5,700 deaths, and our daily rate is now back up to three to 4,000 cases every day, um, where we had peaked before um, 1,800 in April, and we're seeing suddenly 28 to 33 deaths per day, where the, our average had been over the summer and in the early fall, 500 cases a day and something like 10 deaths a day. So suddenly, we have really hit this peak. I just wanna point out the data for the racial differences. This is the health department data back in August where you can see threefold increased incidence of Latino and Latina compared to twofold incidence for African-Americans compared to whites. And those numbers are reversed when it comes to death rates where the black rate in blacks is 156 per 100,000 compared to 120 and 61. And that's what that looks like when it's done graphically. The majority of the cases and deaths are in older folks. But if you look at death rates, you see where the real differences are is not in the age 70 and above. And I'm sorry that got scrambled, but this is age 35 to 60. And that's where there's a much greater toll of this disease in uh, African-Americans and in Hispanics. So uh, every talk I do, I wanna mention the three W's um, and actually provide data. There are now better data that are, are growing and we can talk more about this, but for overall mask versus no mask, you're talking about reducing your risk from 12.8 down to 2.6%, face masks 17.4 down to 3%. So physical distancing is 12 to 2.6. Face mask from 17.4 down to 3% risk. And then for health workers, eye protection has clearly been associated with the benefit in settings where there might be aerosolization and in some essential workers, as you see more and more. The other W, of course, is washing your hands. And I worry with all the attention and debate about masks that people sometimes forget. Washing your hands with every exchange when you go outside that's an important part of um, our adjunct to our improvement of health. And I was really pleased, um, you know, maybe one of the marks of Joe Biden's, um, I think, tenure on the day when the vaccine was announced, 
and he, he was, they went to him for comment. He spent most of his time talking about masks and the reason to talk about masks. And even while we have this great vaccine news, I want to echo what uh, President-elect Biden said, that for this entire coming year, masks are going to be so important still until we actually have distribution and um, inoculation to reach some kind of a 50 to 60 percent mark. So my view of the future, I was telling this to Jim before, is the bad news is I really think we're in the same position one year from now that we are in now. But I think things will be improving dramatically. We will be starting to vaccinate on a large scale. I'd love to be wrong. I'd love for it to be early, earlier than that. But I do think then that um, looking ahead to 2022 is going to be a much different story. And we will actually think about returning to some sense of normalcy uh, at that time. So just uh, thinking about the health and human rights issues, um, it's, it's a vast topic. It's as big as health and human rights for HIV. Um, I do want you all to know one of, the, one of the odd things about the evolution of this epidemic is this is a picture of Wuhan University in the upper right. And I've worked there now for 17 years. I'm working on first an HIV treatment scale-up program and then a medical education reform project. And you see that Zhongnan Hospital in the background. That's where we do all of our training work. That's where Wuhan University's medical school is. And I was there last November, right before the epidemic hit. So I feel like personal, personally involved, and I so admire the response of the local individuals and actually have a tremendous admiration for what China managed to do in suppressing this epidemic. So they're on the other side of this now while we're in the throes. Um, so it's very personal for me that, uh, it, that it first originated in Wuhan. And the kinds of things you hear people talking about and concern for are many. There are free speech and whistleblowing, certainly access to healthcare and prevention. I've been very worried through this entire administration about the right to truth, to good journalism, to scientific advances and freedom from misinformation. And, and COVID has dramatized that in our country. Certainly freedom of mobility and the issues around isolation and quarantine are coming up again and again. And that's why I think we've only got an advisory recommendation right now from IDPH rather than a mandatory lockdown because people are concerned about restricting freedoms unnecessarily. There's been a lot of stigma and discrimination towards people affected with COVID, but also towards their caregivers and towards communities where they're, that are perceived to have higher uh, incidences. And then this extraordinary economic disruption and abuses of power that have come with COVID as an excuse. If you think about vulnerable populations worldwide, this is a very similar list. You're gonna be reminded of pretty much um, the HIV landscape. So in poverty itself and impoverished regions and countries, people who are homeless or institutionalized who have greater vulnerability. Um, in the United States, as you've seen, communities of color, Native Americans, Asians, also Asians is a target of discrimination and stigma. Um, certainly migrant populations, immigrants and refugees. There's been a lot of talk and literature around women as caregivers, as recipients, um, victims of domestic violence because of the greater enclosure and their reliance on for as both food providers, but also um, for childcare. Huge numbers of unemployed. And then again, this vast group of health workers and transit workers, food service workers who simply have to continue working. And I, I love this graphic because I think it tells the, the, the real story of the plight of the essential worker. It, on the left, it says, you'll work in unsafe conditions. You will risk your life to feed me. That's one thing society is saying. They're also saying, should you refuse to work, then you'll be denied jobless pay and you'll starve. And also at the same time this week, the current administration is attacking the Affordable Care Act and trying to take away your, uh, your benefits for healthcare. So, so there's really the, the essential worker, the bus driver, the grocery store clerk is really in a bind because of, uh, because of COVID. Um, I think we're seeing right now the second wave, all of the shortfalls for our preparedness for inadequate testing and a lack of structured testing. Access to the new treatments is a, certainly an issue and that will become 
a very big deal with the new monoclonal antibodies. Uh, access to ICU beds in El Paso is right now a, a huge issue and people are being uh, airlifted out. Um, housing equity, food insecurity, I think Feeding America estimated there'd be a shortage of 8 billion meals in the next 12 months. So certainly one thing that we can do with don donation dollars is to support uh, the uh, food repository and all the food banks. Um, there's been really important issues in free speech and whistleblowing. The doctors who first announced the epidemic in, in Wuhan are the first example. That was at the hands of the Chinese. But we also have the example of the US Navy uh, who fired the admiral on the aircraft carrier for actually calling attention to the fact that he needed greater resources to manage COVID on his ship. And then a study in Cornell identified the very, very clearly that the single greatest source of misinformation in our country was the president of the United States, um, unequivocal data. And we certainly need the shared research and public health acts. I'm certainly are concerned about isolation and quarantine and this, this enormous devastating economic impact. Right now, 28 million Americans are, are facing evictions. So I could go on about that list. I think this was a striking nurse over at the University of Illinois, simply striking for PPE, saying, take care of your health workers. I would like to use this graphic to just, just qualify the question of, high risk, who's at high risk for COVID. Now the list that I'm showing you there is perfectly accurate. I've just shown you evidence that people with these conditions are at greater risk. But if we think about it in the social and political structure, what are the structural factors that cause higher rates of disease and death? Then you can start to add structural racism. You can add living in poor and oppressed communities where you're not safe to leave your home or where there's overcrowding or poorly maintained housing. Or in this era of mass incarceration, if you're incarcerated or if you're institutionalized, you are additionally vulnerable. If you're forced to pay, work as a low paid essential worker, if you don't have health insurance, if you're unhoused or don't have documents. So, so you can see that there's um, structural factors, structural violence is a cause of vulnerability to COVID and it needs to be included in that list. And I don't think I need to tell you all, all the different ways we've seen the deficiencies in the United States in terms of the lack of good funding for our public health infrastructure, the need for a national health service. One example, I think for that poor essential, uh, essential health worker is just a McDonald's worker who doesn't have the ability to take sick leave. So has to come up with symptoms, come to work with symptoms, and then is in the and the, at risk to spread that to coworkers and to people coming into McDonald's. And I am really heartened, as Jim mentioned, by again, President-elect Biden uh, talking about supporting science, living the science, and then appointing this task force with David Kessler and Vivek Murthy as the co-chairs, and really, a, I think, a terrific group of individuals. I know Eric Goosby from his time as the PEPAR director um, one of Chicago's own, Julia Marita, who was Robert Wood Johnson Foundation president, but formerly was a CDPH. And then many of you have probably um, heard Michael Osterholm from the University of Minnesota. So the, the Midwest is well represented, Ezekiel Emanuel, Atul Gawand, some really very bright people who I think will, will give us good informed leadership on the next steps. And I think in the meantime, activism is likely to be needed as was needed in that setting with those nurses. So um, we're going to need, we still need that the deficiencies of this administration continue, these failures continue. So there are PPE shortages in some places. We still have erratic uh, testing policy that differs from state to state. Um, and I'm, I'm very sorry to have seen reports of health workers who care for people with COVID being stigmatized in small and large ways. Um, that's not only in resource limited settings, that's happened here in the United States. So I got to finish so we can have a little bit of time for questions and answers. So let me just make a couple points I want to make sure you, you take home. One is this is a graphic from Wu, Wu Zhenyu, who is the published the large series out of China um, all the way back in March. And it's this red line that comes from the mild illness group. So if we think of the natural history of COVID, 
up to 40% of people really have no symptoms at all, and that makes it very difficult to recognize them. For those with symptoms, 80%, thankfully, are mild to moderate. We send most of those people home with information about how to sequester. But of the 20% who have mild, moderate to severe disease, about 15% need hospitalization and 5% of them will go to the ICU. And the overall mortality is somewhere in the range of 1%. Or as I showed you, for people who come in the hospital, the mortality is somewhere between a 15 and 20%. But I just want to point out, we had um, our medical students did callbacks for patients. And in this series of 410 of the people who are seen and diagnosed and then sent home, 18% of them needed to come back to the ER and around 40 or 10% actually were readmitted. So they fit into this mild category. They weren't very sick, but maybe a week or two later, they actually did get more serious symptoms. So we have to tell people don't, don't give up on the, you know, you, you can't just relax when you go home. If you got sicker, you need to come back to the emergency room and the calls were intended for that. And 3% of those folks went to the ICU and two of them or, or half a percentage point um, ended up dying. So it's a, it's a harrowing two weeks after you get a diagnosis of a positive COVID test. You don't want anyone to relax. You want them to come back when they need to. So what we do when we take care of people is assess their risk factors, especially those who are age over 70. We manage their viral pneumonia. We know how to do this with oxygen, with positive pressure in helmets, and occasionally with intubation. And then we have a number of treatments that we know are effective for moderate to severe disease, remdesivir and dexamethasone, shorten a hospital stay and reduce survival modestly. And then the most, uh, the more recent one that's just been uh, offered by Expanded Access is this bamlanivumab. Um, this is an IV infusion, and it seems to decrease the likelihood of going from uh, pre-symptomatic or mild symptomatic to severe disease. So it'll only be used for high-risk individuals in a limited quantity, and we're just trying to figure out how we're going to use that. All of the rest of people's medical management is these co complications with blood clots and heart toxicity and diabetes control. We know how to manage them, but they can be complicated with a given individual. And these are the different vaccine types. It's just an exceptional explosion of, of, of uh, scientific activity with several different types, virus, virus vector, nucleic acid-based, protein-based, the two that we've had at University of Chicago are the Moderna, which is an mRNA, and we're just starting to enroll the Janssen trial. And just released recently was the Pfizer, another mRNA, and the, the uh, Moderna trial, we're supposed to hear results in the next two weeks. So what did we learn from this Pfizer trial? Um, it, it's a little bit of a complicated process to, um, to give this drug, uh, this vaccine. It requires two doses three weeks apart. Protection is conferred a week later. So you can hear once you start the process with a vaccine, you're not protected until four weeks later. And this was an independent monitoring review by the DSMB. They looked at 38,900 subjects who had gotten two doses. And according to the press conference, I haven't seen the data, we're told that there was a 90% reduction in endpoints. They had 94 people who got COVID. So it must have been something like 85 of them were in the no vaccine arm and something like 5% were in the, um, in the vaccine arm. But we haven't seen the safety data yet. And they're going to keep the study going until they find a total of 164 cases. And then they'll unblind and, and release the data. Um, there are a few things to worry about here. Um, they, started to, they started to measure the efficacy of the vaccine seven days after the last dose. And it may be that they're gonna do it again at 14 and 21 days. Is that too soon? So we, we have to ask that question. And we don't know, even if it's everything I've told you is true, we don't know how long that lasts. And that's a very important question. I, there's reasons to think that this will not be short-lived or only a month or three months, but very good chance that this gives a many years of protection. But we have to find that out. We can't just say that. And as I mentioned, it takes two doses separated by three weeks. The logistics will be complicated. It requires cold storage chain at 70 degrees below zero centigrade. So 
its implementation is going to be really pretty tricky. And then um, Jim already asked about the long-term sequelae. So I'll just tell you what I, I think I told you everything before that. Oh yeah, long-term dialysis. A third of patients in, in New York who were hospitalized had some form of acute kidney injury and 15% required dialysis. So there will be ongoing chronic morbidity um, from this and probably more further mortality. So um, that's, our, that's the clinical summary. Um, certainly the epidemic is volatile and unstable. I think you all know about the three W's. I urge you to follow them personally. And in these next three weeks, let's do what IDPH says and try to work at home, only go out when you need to and share that with your friends and family. And I think I've covered all the rest of these um, issues on the clinical summary and I'll I'll finish with this human rights slide and then open it up for questions. And I, I wanna say again, uh, just how, uh, how glad I am to come and share this with you all at AFC, how much I admire your work and what you do every day. I know that COVID's complicated everything that you do and probably made it even more important. These personal contacts by chat, by, by uh, Zoom, any ways that you can stay connected, I hope that you'll do that. I hope you'll take care of yourselves by getting outside as much as you can and not uh, succumbing to isolation and, and understanding that we can do this for another year if, if then we're pointed in the right direction. I do believe we're suddenly now in the last two weeks, lots of reasons to be more optimistic than I was two weeks ago. So thanks again, uh, Jim and John for the invitation. Thank you, Renslow. Wow, that was really an incredible presentation. So much data, but you, the way you told the story, um, um, really powerful, really interesting. There are a lot of questions in the chat, so we're going to go through them. Good. And if you'd like, you can um, stop sharing your screen so we can yeah. better see each other. And if people want to go off uh, camera or go on camera, I should say, feel free. You're not, no pressure. Um, one question, a um, couple of quicker I think easier ones or shorter ones and then some longer ones. The first one, and I also noticed this, um, Audrey is asking, can you explain the bubble that says fried chicken and tortillas are not risk factors? Yeah. I mean, I, I'm relieved that they're not, but what were you, <laughs> what were you getting at in that, in that case? I, I'm relieved as well. Um, that was that slide come from Linda Ray Murray, my friend who was the president of the American public health association. And um, it was, it was about the um, racial predilection differences in incidence and in mortality. And there was a, there was a commentator on, um, I forget, it was, it was a rural network, but who had, had talked about um, jokingly about those being the, the, the vectors that had caused um, additional, additional cases. Um, so it was a racist statement that she was compromised. She was, challenging and rightly so. And in fact, I mean, isn't this the era, this last four years, where somehow people have felt licensed to, to say overtly racist things and take overtly racist positions. And I just wanna say how glad I am that that era is coming to an end, how unacceptable that is, and how important it is to be actively anti-racist. So if we've learned anything out of this last four years, it's, it's not just enough to shake your head and and understand that that's unacceptable, it, it means you have to actually speak up and challenge it whenever you hear it. And that's a, it's a very Im, important lesson, a, another lesson just like how important it is to vote. Yeah, we, we certainly learned that this year. Right on, so thank you for that explanation. I'm gonna start going down the list here. So back in the summer, we saw lots of protests and Alex wants to know, do you think the protests could have had an impact on increases in cases in Chicago? Do we have any understanding about the role protests may have played or not? Well, I've seen some mixed data on that. Actually, the preponderance of evidence has been surprisingly an inability to make that association. So people have looked at some of the larger demonstrations um, and not found that link. But I don't wanna go quite that far. Um, so let's take some of the examples where there has been an association. The bikers rally in the Dakotas very clearly has led to cases and deaths. 
there's a very elegant study of the most recent spate of uh, Trump rallies where there's an in, there's a, an increase in the in the county in which that was held. That's a that's a I think a very well done study suggesting the Trump rallies actually did. I think we've seen that the White House the White House is a living example of what happens if you have uh, an outbreak in your workplace and you ignore it and you suppress it and you don't really you don't talk about it and then you don't actually implement any actions to do anything about it. So we've actually seen second waves now within the outbreak at the White House that was associated with the nomination of the Supreme Court justice candidate and and other events. So so that's a cautionary tale. It 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 you really this is not something that can be ignored and it's complicated to implement good uh, workplace safety. Um, it, so think about where has it worked well, you know, in the examples that we've seen worldwide, it's tended to be where there's some form of structured sequential testing, oftentimes using the Abbott rapid test. I think it's been an interesting um, thing to observe that an imperfect test, maybe less than the best, at finding an individual case has actually been good enough to help identify people at risk of spreading and to immediately, so it's sequential testing associated with isolation and quarantine for known cases and the space to do that. Maybe the best example of that is our own Cook County Jail, which really has stood as a model for incarcerated individuals for being very aggressive at identifying people and sequestering them, making space to allow for that kind of sequestration, because that's an important component here. And, uh, and using the, in this case, the rapid test was, was very helpful for all incoming individuals. You know, the other things they've done, they did, they limited visitors for a time. So they it restricted outsiders. So it's a very rational group of limit new people coming into a space, isolate those that are either sick or have fever or that test positively with, with regular sequential testing. And, and this can be managed. I mean, I think that's the other thing we've learned is some places have done it very well. Some places have done it very poorly and you pay for it if you're, if you're not careful in attending to it. That, that's great. So that leads me into another question and I'll just note, uh, thank you for that really thoughtful answer. Um, what we saw with a lot of the Black Lives Matter related protests were people um, masking and distancing. Yes. And the, the examples you gave of large gatherings, we did not see masking and distancing. That's right. But really following up on what your final comments were, Michael has a question. Um, outside of decisions from local government and public administration, why has the Midwest been so heavily hit by COVID-19 recently? What are your thoughts about that? Yeah. Well, and I'll um, remind you, we have like eight minutes, so so um, okay. You may not be able to give as as full of answer as you'd like. <laughs> no, no. Um, it's funny. Green Bay, Wisconsin, um, their first epidemic was in among a, a large group of um, largely Hispanics in a meat packing plant. So there was meat packing. If there's a source of um, crowding and either indifference or active hostility towards COVID precautions. So I think you saw early on, there was actually a national mandate from our president that said, that's essential work. Meat packers um, are critical and we need those, those plants to stay open. So, so you can't close and also you can't change the way you do business. Um, and so that was one beginning in Green Bay. That was coupled with several actions in Green Bay, which to say the least, were confusing for the public. So you had the, you had the Supreme Court in Wisconsin at odds with the governor, who was trying to implement safety precautions, um, a requirement for to, for using a mask, several different steps, and so so the mixed messaging, which was true nationally, was very profound in Wisconsin, and it and it led to mixed behavior. Um, much less compliance overall. It was sort of perceived as a disease that was in certain populations in plants. And then there was controversy. Uh, it, they, they got caught up a little bit in the, in the politics of wearing a mask rather than in the public health implementation. Um, that's only the same thing in Indiana, which is now, um, you know, got a raging epidemic. There was 
not a strong mandate from their public health leadership or from their governor. That's been true throughout. And um, so I'm, I'm afraid that, that it's really, um, because we've seen that areas and regions that do follow those recommendations and New York City, I think, would have to be sort of the, the standard for a terrible epidemic, then a lockdown and its consequences, and then actually fairly good, in a, in a crowded space, fairly good implementation of distancing and of the wearing of masks. And up until the current time, that's been successful. And I want to be careful. I made this point to Jim um, earlier. Um, our administration has failed dreadfully and continues to do so. I'm the sharpest critic. But if you think of an effective government with, with um, good, good public health, with stable, um, stable economy, take Germany, where all things are lined up well with a very um, smart and effective leader, they're also having the same trouble at the current time that we are. So we have a, we have a dreadful adversary in COVID. So it, it's not only lining up the politics and good public health and thinking that you're home free. It turns out this is really a dreadful enemy. And there's mm -hmm. dissent in Germany as well. They do also have a, they have a far right and they have people who think that this has all been made up by the government. They're, they're having the same, the same problem. So it's, this isn't only a United States exclusive problem. This is, this is worldwide. And we've made things much worse in several ways. We are still unprepared for this second wave, which I find actually appalling. Um, unprepared for testing expansion, unprepared even for PPE, especially in smaller cities and you know, more remote areas. We're, right now, you're seeing states, again, vying against each other for getting um, necessary equipment or testing materials. So again, the lack of federal standards and uh, guidance has just been dreadful. And I'm sorry that we are, you know, that we have another couple of months before we even get the new leadership. That's we're going to pay for that uh, for that lack. But I've I've been critical all the way along. Yeah, it's really striking. We need to be doing better in every way, and the only way we're going to get over this is like everything has to be firing as as efficiently and as as smartly as possible. Yeah. This is a quick question. You had shown, um, Nadine noted that you had shown um, some race data for Chicago and Illinois that was from August um, regarding diagnoses and deaths. Yeah. Uh, do you have, is there data that is more current than August or is that the best, the most current we have for that kind of data? I think they've also reported September. It's the same as far as I know. I mean, we're still seeing the, those disparities. It's tough to, to keep up with all the numbers. And, and you're, it's a very good thing that you point that out. You really, you wanna know, especially for incidence data, you, you really need to know what's happened in the last couple of weeks. You saw that sharp uptick just in the, in the last couple of weeks on all of these indicators. So you're right to ask the question. As far as I know, that has still continued to be the case. There was an amazing presentation, which I haven't heard more about, um, Let's see, where was this? This was at, um, in San Francisco at the, the meetings in July from the Cook County Hospital where they compared their first 400 admissions to their second 400 admissions. And the first 400 were like 80% African-American. The second 400 were almost the equal number, 80% um, Latino, Latina. So a huge shift in the demographic um, in those folks who were admitted to the county hospital. And you saw in that era, we were more, much more African American as well. We have um, recent, more recently, an increased number of Hispanics, but not to that uh, level. I think we're at about twenty percent more recently. But I really appreciate the question. That's um, whoever is asking that is sharply watching the slides in the midst of a lot of data. It's very helpful to have the most current data, and there's so much data being published about COVID. It's it's very difficult to keep it up. Yeah, that's Nadine. She's our VP of policy. So she's a data hawk. Okay. So um, this is coming from Simone. Um, and she has a comment and then a question. Some people are interpreting the apparent reduction in likelihood of death with a green light to loosen restrictions. Obviously, this is not the case for many communities, but I worry that folks hear media reports and misunderstand their risk. 
do you have language we can use to address this? Yeah, I, I'm troubled by this as well. I've, I've seen as, oh, we're so much better at taking care of people in the hospital and we have these new therapies. And so that's just not true. People are still dying. Um, there was just a, a high school student in, um, I think in, in Northern Indiana who died. Um, yeah, you know, it's, it's true. <clears throat> I'm glad that it's true that the death rate has fallen, but people are still dying. And I, I take no comfort from that. And especially while the rates are going so much higher, um, we're going to see a, a new peak. So uh, I thought, I thought um, uh, Carlos Del Rios um, in Atlanta had a very good statement around this, which is if in the United States, a thousand people are dying every day, that's two jumbo jets falling out of the sky every day. How should we be reacting to that loss of life? How would we be reacting to that if it were air, airline safety, you know, to put that analogy? So I think it's true that it's difficult to not be numb with the repeated numbers. They're, they just become numbers. This was true in the, in the worst time, the worst era of the HIV epidemic. You got sort of numb with all of the numbers of, of new incident cases and, and mortality and everywhere in the world, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. These are all individuals. This is, you know, I, there's, I think there was evidence that one in every six Americans had uh, knew somebody, had close friends, family who had died from COVID. These are our grandparents. These are our loved ones. I, I, I don't know how to dramatize that to, for people to take it seriously. It's very difficult also because I was, when I made calls to people to tell them that they had tested positive, and they'd been sent home, they weren't sick. So I was introducing them to the stay at home for now for 10 days or for 14 days if you have some uh, comorbidity. And um, we always talked about if you got sick, then go back to the emergency room because most people who go to the emergency room do survive and don't be shy or reluctant to do that. <clears throat> um, so it's a harrowing two week waiting period because you can't be sure if you happen to be in that little small percentage of people who do progress. Um, so 80% of people do well. And if, if someone says back to you, yes, but 80% of people do well, well, they're telling the truth. That's, you know, that's truthful. It, that's just not a calculation I'm, I'm willing to make personally with um, the lives of you know, my coworkers and my community. Um, yeah, I, I think you're, you're the Carlos Del, I heard Carlos Del Rio's uh, comment too. And we can all remember almost every major airline crash that we've ever experienced or seen in, in the world, right? In the news, you could go back and you know where you were when it happened, how, how scary it was, how everyone was glued to the TV and worried and upset. And this is two of those every day. And it seems to go, a lot of us seem to be, you know, it's going unnoticed. Um, I have a couple more questions and then, you know, Renzo, if you stay as long as you can, and then we can also follow up by email. Let me know when you need to go. Sure. I I'm know good till 1.30, are... so I, I'm fine. You know me. Okay, talk, well, talk too you know long. what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hang with you, and other people may leave, but we'll be able to send this out to everyone. They'll get the whole thing in the transcript as well. But um, Cynthia Tucker uh, wanted to thank you for the presentation, and her question is about how we can maybe best or better approach pharma and policymakers to, you know, do better with testing, have more equitable testing and treatments, um, and to respond to the other conditions we need to improve, like access to fresh, clean drinking water, food, stable housing, <clears throat> um, in communities of color who are being, you know, um, ravaged by COVID. This is not an easy or quick question, but no. any top line thoughts would be great. No, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think um, we, when Linda Ray Murray talks about this, um, she, she, she sort of makes this connection for, um, then the reason I like to talk about the Declaration of Human Rights is it, it describes itself as not being a, an a la carte menu. You can't have one, one from here and one from column B and it all goes together. You either um, believe in and, and appreciate it all in the interdependence of 
different rights. So rights to a safe and clean environment and to healthcare. Um, so I, I think the, the remedy, you know, it, it, this is a unique moment in time because of the confluence of these two epidemics and one epidemic is COVID, but the other is the epidemic of police violence, mass incarceration and recognition of racism and white supremacy is, as realities in our country that need attention. And that's, that's unique. It's a unique moment in part because of Black Lives Matter. And I'm sorry to say because of the dreadful violent actions by some police officers against people of color. But it means that we have, I think, a, a unique moment to make those connections to say people are vulnerable to COVID and they're vulnerable to violence and re repeating the cycle of violence because of poor housing and redlining. That that's a, that's a reality that takes place well away from our hospitals or from our police stations. And yet redlining has consequences that, that promote violence, um, black on black violence promotes gun violence. Um, and that's a connection that can be drawn a little more easily. How to get policymakers then to get to the next step is certainly part of our challenge. We're we're in a better we're in a better position to do it right now. I would also say because of the extraordinary diversity in our legislatures and and again a recognition of the importance of that group. And you could say, hey, that's the group that has really contributed significantly to electing President-elect Biden. You know he's got a very strong group of people who are, who are making these connections and who are going to look for social justice, housing justice, justice food equity as remedies and, and police reform as remedies to um, those problems. I would say remedies to mass incarceration. You know, one of the things the county jail did and other jails did as this came down, as COVID came down, was to go through the ranks and say, who, who can be decarcerated? Who can be sent home in some form of supervision who doesn't actually have to be in jail? And that substantially reduced risk. It also reduced, not enough, but to a small degree, um, the you know, over-incarceration, particularly of young men of color. And, that's that's an urgent agenda item for our uh, for our country, and I, I I really appreciate the question. I I very much include that in this talk because I think that's as important a part of our remedy as any vaccine or the widespread use of masks. Um, though those are those are critical for COVID and social distancing, but the other side of the coin is improving our lives and working towards social justice. Without question, that's as of equal value. And I think it's proven to be of equal value in your lives as HIV uh, case managers and, and, and case workers and, um, you know, and fundraisers. Right. I mean, it, it completely, everything you say completely overlaps with HIV uh, and it's so important. And I love, again, the other, the analogy of the a la carte menu, you can't just sort of pick and choose Oh. Um, I have one more question and I okay. think they're still on. This is from Duffy. So what does reinfection look like for those with prior illness and antibody development? If reinfection recurs or if it comes again, is infection typically less severe or yeah. more severe? Yeah. What do we know about that? Well, we don't know much. Um, we know that it can occur. So there's pretty well documented rare cases so far. So far, it appears that it's less severe in, uh, in several cases, totally without symptoms. And, and unfortunately, that's the beginning and end of what we know about it. Um, we, we do have a sense that the, it's hard to predict the level of immunity that arises with one infection. Um, is, it, does the, is the durability the same or different for different people in terms of relative immunity, but it seems like it, it may be short-lived. And in those cases, reinfection occurred in one case within um, two months, another case after like uh, six months. Yeah, so two jumbo jets every day. Um, I'm just reading the chat. 
<laughs> yeah, <laughs> that I mean, it does grab you that number, and I think yeah, it, it is. It, there is some way to stop the just the relentlessness of the numbers. I, I show those numbers, but I do worry that they are uh, they're almost you know they're almost uh, making us numb to their impact because they're so so huge. And unlike the HIV era, you know, in my first in my first two months with HIV, I think we had three cases. And in the first four years, I had 140 cases at the county hospital. This was a case of our first 400 cases in the first four weeks. And we're now up to, you saw 6,000. I mean, it's, this is a tsunami where that was a trickle and that's a huge difference. Yeah, it, it become, they become abstractions and they don't become real. And I think that's where the power of like personal stories is so important and bringing it back down. Like, I'm glad we had, you know, someone telling their personal story for our grand rounds. And I was watching the news last night and there was a, a young woman. I mean, she was probably in her thirties um, who was really sick with COVID, like yeah. being, being interviewed from her hospital bed, having a hard time breathing, right. talking about her story. And that's sort of what brings it, you know, the, the, the most personal, the most intimate is what brings it home. And I think we need more of that to understand, to get our heads around. That's, like that woman, there's like, thank God she wasn't part of that jumbo jet, but plenty of people like her were lost. People who have families. I think Carlos also mentioned, so for these jumbo jets that have gone down, or maybe I saw this somewhere else, but everyone who, had, who has lost someone from COVID, there's nine or 10, at least nine or 10 people who are grieving. Yeah. Um, and so you put that into context about people's lives, their friends, their partners, their workspaces, and the impact uh, is huge, but it, it, again, I think the abstraction of these numbers, we, we lose that. We and do. we've been hearing tens of thousands all <laughs> year and it just doesn't seem to be real anymore when it couldn't be more than real, right? Yeah. I think you saw uh, that's a motivator, exactly what you say, that that was a motivator for, um, for people exercising their right to vote that a large part of the turnout had to do with, I, I am affected by this. I have been affected by this one way or another. Um, yeah. I think, I don't think it was only COVID turnout, but I think it, it was a big driver. And we, we've been so traumatized. Um, we are in, still in the midst of this collective trauma and we haven't really had time to deal with it largely because of the, 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 the craziness of the rest of the world. And, and, um, and I think we're we're going to begin to to feel this. Um, and it, you know, so we're only you know, we're only starting. It's so strange to say here in in November, but we're only still just starting this experience with COVID. It's just beginning, and that's really remarkable. My hope is we're also at the beginning of the end. That will be my optimistic statement, but not uh, not not for a little while. And so we'll. We'll follow our three W's and try to support ourselves and take care of ourselves. I hope that's true. Um, so, yeah. Well, yeah, very sobering, but I, I appreciate the, we, we do have glimmers and we can see a corner we're turning. Um, we're gonna be in for some rough times, but um, hopefully things are falling into place that we can, um, this isn't going to be um, forever, but I, I appreciate you keeping it very real. I think um, yeah. human, human, you, we love to be in denial and love to, uh, you know, minimize for our own mental health. And um, I think it's important that we hear it straight up the way it really is. So thank you, Rinslow. Sure. Um, we have a few people you, left. Rinslow. If anyone wants to say anything. You're welcome, John. It's great go. to see you. Good to see you too. Thank you for, yeah. as, as always. Yeah, sure. Really appreciate it. And Jim, thank you. Yeah. yeah. Thanks for, Pleasure. for having me. Good. All right. Well, I gotta Rinslow, run. Thank make, you all. Rinslow makes me look good. Rinslow is like one of the superstars. Excellent presentation. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much. Hey. And um, we may have to invite you again in a okay. few months to do an update. That sounds good. You so take I'll care, Jim. All, all right. right. Thank you. You too. Okay. And thanks all. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.